uh, Jeremy Keat, a very famous web developer, veteran in the industry, from a company from Clearweb, Clearweb UK. He's a writer, a speaker, and my fellow uh, organizer of UX London Deconstruct and other events. So please welcome Jeremy. Thank you. Havala Ivo, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, w Utro, good morning. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm, I'm here to talk about design, kind of. Actually, I'll follow on from Ivo's joke. Uh, how many designers does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, change? I'm not changing anything. Um, before I talk about design and the web, which is, this is web summer camp after all, I want to talk about uh, music. And specifically, I want to talk about ways of approaching musical composition, different kind of schools of thought. On the one hand, you'd have, let's say, the classical approach, exemplified by, say, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart here, where you can compose the music and get it all down onto sheet music. Very precise, this indicates which notes to play, how long to play them for. You can even indicate some hints as to how to play the, the piece of music. So very, very precise, note-for-note -note musical composition. That's kind of the, the classical approach. Now, a very different approach would be uh, someone like Miles Davis. You, you take, for example, his, his uh, Kind of Blue classic album, and in a way there was sheet music for it going in. This, this was the sheet music for the first track on Kind of Blue. So what, right? It was literally like one interval, that's it. And he goes in with sketches, he goes in with scales, he doesn't allow the musicians to rehearse anything ahead of time, and records. And we get a masterpiece. So, obviously, two very different approaches. The classical approach and the, the jazz approach. And what this kind of reminds me of, this way of kind of dividing things into two different approaches, is something from the world of, of programming. And I think you can divide most programming languages into two different categories. On the one hand, you've got imperative programming languages, and this would be most programming languages, right? General purpose programming languages where you describe how a program operates. You, you give it step-by-step -step instructions, right? So, this, I mean, over the last few days, we've had workshops here on JavaScript, on PHP, you know, you think of, you know, Python, Java, all these languages, these are all imperative programming languages. Very powerful, general purpose programming languages. Um, so an example of, of how something might look in an imperative programming language, this is pseudocode, but, right, you step-by-step -step instructions, maybe create an array, uh, loop through each item in the array, test to see if a condition is true, return results, right? So you've got, you got loops, you've got arrays, you've got ifs, you've got returns. These are, these are the kind of um, the, the meat and potatoes of imperative programming languages. The other category of programming language is declarative programming. Uh, where here, you don't describe the step-by-step -step instructions, you describe the output. Say, here's what I want to happen, and I don't care how it happens under the hood. Right? Now, declarative pr programming languages tend not to be general-purpose programming languages. They're usually domain-specific. They're generally not as powerful. Um, though I'd say the, the trade-off there is they may be less powerful, but they're often easier to learn. You know, with an imperative programming language, you have to get your head around loops and arrays and ifs and all that, all that stuff. Whereas with a declarative language, it's more about saying what you want to happen. So maybe less powerful, but maybe easier to learn. Now, a classic example of a, a declarative language would be structured query language, or SQL, SQL. Um, you know, how you'd interact with a database. You'd write instructions in, almost in plain English to say, I want you to select these items from this table where some condition is true. Now, it might be that under the hood, the computer is going to create an array of items, loop through each one, see if this test condition is true, but you don't need to care about that. You don't need to care about how something's happening under the hood. You just care about the end result. Okay, so those are the two categories of programming language, imperative and declarative. So let's take a look at how this might apply to where I work and where I'm guessing most of you work too, which is the World Wide Web. 
where does this, this split fit in with the World Wide Web? So the World Wide Web, uh, invented by this man, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, when he was working at CERN in Switzerland uh, in the 1980s. And, you know, it's a whole bunch of scientists working together there, and there's a lot of chaos around managing all the information. And being the good computer nerd that he is, Tim Berners-Lee proposes a solution to this. He writes this memo called Information Management, a proposal. Terrible title. It's riddled with typos. It's got incomprehensible diagrams. And yet, his supervisor, Mike Sendall, must, must have seen something in this proposal because he scrawled across the top, vague but exciting. And so Tim Berners-Lee got to go ahead. Yeah, you go, you go ahead and work on that, that project of yours, this uh, information management project. And this is what became the World Wide Web. Now, Tim Berners-Lee had ideas and design principles in mind when he was creating the World Wide Web. For example, one of the design principles he adhered to was the principle of least power. And the principle of least power states, choose the least powerful language suitable for a given purpose. Which sounds really counterintuitive. Like, why would I choose something less powerful than something else? But this kind of goes back to what I was saying about, you know, ease of learning, ease of use. Um, a less powerful language might be domain-specific, might be more robust, because a more powerful language, general purpose language, might be more fragile or harder to learn, right? So this kind of manifests in, in the language that Tim Berners-Lee creates, which is HTML, Hypertext Markup Language, very much a declarative language, very much domain-specific. It's about uh, hypertext, it's about the World Wide Web. And its very deliberate design decision around HTML is that it is fault tolerant. Uh, what I mean by that is if you make a mistake in the HTML, a web browser isn't going to just give up the ghost. It's not going to pause when it hits that mistake and not go any further. It's just going to see something it doesn't understand and go, I'll skip over that, move on to the next thing, right? So it's, it's fault tolerant, which again, I think, makes it easier for people to get started with. Um, that like it's, it's tolerant of mistakes. Uh, the next programming language we got a few years later was CSS, Cascading Style Sheets, which is also a declarative language. Um, and you might think, hang on, declarative language? No, 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 it's CSS. I'm telling the browser what to do. I'm describing step-by-step -step instructions on how things should be styled, right? No, you're not. You're suggesting what the browser should do. And it was Eric Meyer who said that every line of CSS you write is a suggestion to the browser. Um, I think that's, that's worth keeping in mind. Uh, also, CSS is fault tolerant. You write a piece of CSS that uh, the browser doesn't understand, it won't throw an error when it hits that line, it won't refuse to parse the rest of the style sheet, it just ignores what it doesn't understand and moves on to the next bit. Turns out this is super powerful, and again, makes it an easier language to learn. Um, now, CSS did not come from Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, this is about four or five years later. It's 1994, and how come William Lee proposed the initial version of CSS? It was initially called Cascading HTML Style Sheets. And in an email to the discussionist, he proposed syntax that looked something like this. Now, this isn't what we ended up with today, but it's kind of interesting to look at it now and squint at it and see, yeah, I can kind of see where it's getting at, right? Um, you kind of got selectors and properties mixed up together with the dot syntax, much more like uh, uh, imperative languages we know. Um, but you can kind of understand what's going on. They're like, oh, I see. We're saying that all the H1s should be 24 points and all the H2s should be 20 points. But what's with those percentages at the end? 100%, 40%? Well, this was an early idea that never made it into production. This idea called influence, that you as the author would pretty much specify how much do you care, right? Like, so when I say 24 points for H1s, I really mean 24 points for H1s. But when I say, you know, 20 points for H2s, it's like, eh, I care 40%. And the idea here was that you aren't the only one who gets a say in how things should be styled, that there's these competing concerns. There's you, the author of the document, there's the user agent, the browser, that has its own styles by default. And there's the user, and that the user may also have ideas about how things should be styled and that those opinions matter. 
So the idea was that everyone would specify this level of influence for each style declaration. And then there was some hand-wavy stuff about browsers then figure out the ideal size based on all of these competing concerns, and voila. Obviously, it didn't work out. That last step turned out to be really, really complex. But I think the idea of influence is really interesting. That you know gets us, again, away from thinking that you are specifying how something should look when you write CSS. No, 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 you are suggesting. Because, yeah, users used to be able to specify style sheets as well, user style sheets. Not user agent style sheets, which is what the browser gives you, but that users themselves would provide style sheets to say, this is how I want things to look. This has been removed from uh, pretty much all browsers now, which I think is kind of a shame. You can still do it today, but you probably have to install a browser extension. Um, interestingly, if anyone's using the Arc browser, they're sort of bringing this back. They call it Boosts, but it's kind of the same idea that you as the user should have some influence over how things look. I, I like this idea. I like this idea that, you know, again, when we're, when we're writing CSS or writing anything on the web, that we aren't dictating here's how things should be, but more about getting into a conversation with the user. You know, here's what I value. What do you value? Let's come to an agreement. I love that idea. And I think it is, it is a bit of a shame that user style sheets are gone. I understand why it was taken away. It was kind of a, a power feature. Most people did not use it. But I sort of see a little bit of a resurgence in this idea and in the idea of influence coming back into CSS. And I see it happening in media queries level five, specifically with these at prefers media queries, where now the user can specify, I prefer reduced motion. I prefer a certain color scheme. I prefer reduced data. Right now, it's still up to you as the developer to honor these preferences, right? You have to pay attention to them and write CSS that honors the preference. But I do like this idea that now we're getting back into the conversation with the user. It's not us dictating to the user, this is how things are going to be, but we listen and we come to an agreement with the user. So I, I, this, I think there's something interesting happening here with this kind of return of the idea of influence from the very, very early days of CSS. Now, there's one final language uh, that we use in the front end on the World Wide Web, and that is JavaScript. This came along later again. Um, this is not a declarative language. This is an imperative language. So again, like all those programming languages, it's more general purpose. Yes, it was invented for the web, but it can be used in all sorts of other places. As we now know, it gets used on servers, gets used on your own computers all the time. It's powerful, general purpose, imperative language. It is not fault tolerant. Unlike HTML and CSS, where you know, errors are ignored and you just move on to the next thing, if you write a piece of JavaScript that the browser doesn't understand, the browser will stop error and refuse to render the rest of the, the or parse the rest of the JavaScript file. So that's kind of the, the price we pay. I mean, to be fair, I, I think it would be pretty much impossible to make a fault tolerant imperative language. It would be very hard. Certainly, debugging would become extremely difficult. We're like, there's a problem with your code, but you don't know where it is because you know, it's just ignored. Um, so I get why it's not fault tolerant. So this is what we have on the web. In order, we have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Two declarative languages that are fault tolerant, and one imperative language that is not fault tolerant. Now, I made the mistake um, for quite a while of thinking, oh, declarative languages are fault tolerant. I started to see causation where there was just correlation. And that's not true. You can absolutely have declarative languages that are not fault tolerant as well. I mean, a classic example would be XML. This is a declarative language, kind of like HTML, but the rules for XML state, if you encounter an error, stop and refuse to render anything at all, right? So there you've got kind of the worst of both worlds. You've got a declarative language that is not fault tolerant. All right, so this is our stack on the front end of the web, which is kind of the bit that I care about, the front end. And this is also pretty much how I like to approach building on the web, is to, to have this solid foundation of structure with HTML, then the style suggestions in CSS, and then when I need to reach for the more powerful stuff that I can't accomplish here, 
I reach for a general purpose imperative programming language that is but careful because it's not fault tolerant, and that's JavaScript. So that's how I tend to approach it. So, the world of programming, you can basically divide things into two, imperative and declarative languages, two different paradigms. But maybe more importantly, I think these are also emblematic of two different mindsets, two ways of approaching how you build something. And I think the kind of mindset you have will probably influence which kind of language you'd gravitate towards. Um, let's, take a, let's take an example of um, we're going we're gonna to solve a problem on the web. We're going to build a component. We're going to build a button component. How will we go about doing this? Because I mean, on one of the nice things about the web is there's, there's so many different ways of doing anything, right? There's no one way of doing things. Well, one way you could build a, a button component is create everything from scratch. You'd have the bare minimum HTML, maybe just a div or a span, and then you provide all the functionality, right? What happens when it's clicked? Uh, don't forget to add the keyboard functionality. Uh, make sure it's accessible there, right? Um, all, all of this, this functionality, you, you'd need to provide yourself, and you can do that in JavaScript. General purpose programming language, it's very powerful, great. That's the imperative approach. Or you could just use a freaking button, uh, the declarative approach. This is my preferred approach would be I would reach for the declarative solution here, mostly because I'm very lazy. I don't want to have to provide all this stuff if I can just do that. Um, so it feels to me that, you know, when I see these two approaches, imperative and declarative, when it comes to doing something like creating a button, for me personally, the declarative approach looks like uh, the right way to go. And partly, like, again, that's to do with my attitude to how I build on the web, like trying to do as much as I can in HTML, then CSS, and then only reaching for JavaScript when possible. Um, I, I've summed up my attitude to JavaScript on the web, on the front end, like this. JavaScript should do what only JavaScript can do. In other words, you reach for JavaScript when, when you've run out of options in the, in the lower parts of the stack, in the declarative parts. This is really just the principle of least power reframed for the World Wide Web. I hasten to add, I'm talking about JavaScript in the browser on the front end. What you do you know, on the back end, if you're writing stuff, you know, that's another world entirely. Uh, the fact that the language happens to be JavaScript is, is different. It's about the environment of the World Wide Web. All right, so I would take the declarative approach, but I want to understand why would anyone do this? Why would anyone reject the declarative approach and choose to do this? Because this, this happens all the time. People make a choice to create buttons using just a div and shit tons of JavaScript. And I used to just think, ah, they don't get it. They don't understand the web. But uh, I don't like that feeling, and I think that's dismissive. And I want to understand the mindset. Because um, for me, like I said, a button by default, the button element, it comes with some default styling. But I can alter that default styling if I want to. More importantly, it comes with a whole bunch of default behaviors, right? It handles clicks and uh, keyboards. It's accessible by default, right? Its accessibility roles are exposed automatically. I don't have to think about this. The browser does a lot of work for me. So again, why would somebody do this? And I realized that if you're coming from that imperative mindset, that kind of computer science background, then all of those features that the browser gives you for free, the styling by default, the behaviors by default, the functionality, those aren't features, those are bugs. Because if you haven't written everything from scratch, then what if there's some unknown behaviors, some unknown stylings you get for free? You, you, you'd be hesitant to use that, right? Because here I know exactly what's going to happen. I've written it all from scratch. Whereas if I hand over to the browser, I'm kind of entrusting my fate to the browser. So I kind of get why people want to write everything from scratch. It's about control. It's about wanting to feel in control, right? So you write everything from scratch and you feel in control. That's, that's the kind of the lure of the imperative mindset. And it makes sense. Like I said, if you're coming from an, a computer science background, you've learned how to do this in, in, in university, it is all about specifying things precisely in computer code, then that's what you're going to do. You're going to specify everything 
precisely. And those free behaviors you'd get from a web browser are undesirable. There could be unexpected side effects. Whereas if you invent from scratch, you at least have the feeling of control. Whereas the declarative approach and using a declarative language in general can feel like giving up control, right? But I would say that control comes at a cost, because in order to have that feeling of control, you're going to have to make certain uh, assumptions. Well, I would say the declarative mindset is about trying to avoid assumptions. I'll, I'll, I'll show an example of what I mean about avoiding assumptions. Now, we're going to dive into a declarative language, CSS, but we're going to see two different mindsets, the imperative and the declarative mindset at work. All right. So let's say I've written some CSS like this for styling a button. Perfectly reasonable CSS, font size 16 pixels, padding left 16 pixels. But do I really mean 16 pixels? Or do I actually mean I want the font size to be the default browser font size? And am I making an assumption that the default browser font size is 16 pixels? Well, if, I, if what I mean is the default browser font size, I should specify that using you know, a relative unit like rem. So one rem is the default browser font size. Now, 99% of the time, that's going to evaluate to 16 pixels. So the assumption was relatively safe, but here, if someone does decide to change their default browser font size to something other than 16 pixels, this is going to work just fine. So again, maybe more of a dialogue with the user rather than me dictating pixel values to the user. So now I've removed the assumption that the default browser font size is 16 pixels. When I say padding left, do I really mean padding left? Or do I mean the padding at the beginning of the text? Because if that's what I mean, I can be you know, more intentional about that. And I can say padding inline start is one RAM. Now, padding left and padding inline start are basically the same thing if we're in a left-to-right language, like English. Uh, if this ever ends up getting translated into, say, a right-to-left language, then the padding at the start of the text would be on the right. Now, you may not have any plans to ever translate your website, and you might think, I don't need to worry about this, but your user might translate the website. Right? They have tools in the browser to do this. So again, removing the assumption that the the content's always going to be displayed in a specific language. Um, and if I really want to get into you know, more of a dialogue with the user and respond to the user's device, I could start making the font size relative to the width of the user's screen. Um, here I'm using the VW unit, viewport width unit. Uh, and so now the, the button will be bigger or smaller depending on whether the screen is bigger or smaller. Um, you'll notice I'm using calc here with a, a rem and VW. That's for accessibility reasons. If I only used VW, then there'd be no way to bump the font size up and down. Um, by mixing it in with a relative unit that responds to font size changes, I make sure it stays accessible. Um, so here I'm, I'm saying, yeah, just make the button size relative to the viewport. Now, maybe I've gone too far because maybe at small screens, it's going to get really small. And maybe at large screens, it's going to get really big. So let's step back and put some guardrails in place. I'm going to use clamp. I'm still sticking with the same declaration as before for the, the size. This is the, the size I want to declare. But now, thanks to clamp, I can throw in a minimum and a maximum. So I can say, this is the font size, right? Res, res, uh, it, it's relative to the user screen, but never go below one rem and never go above 1.5 rems. I don't even need to use the calc function in the middle here. It just automatically figures it out. Um, so this is, this is nice now because, yes, I'm responding to the user screen width, but I'm also putting some, some boundary conditions in place so it doesn't get out of control. But it, I probably wouldn't do this on the button element. Uh, what I'd probably do is I'd do this on, on the entire interface. I'd want everything to, to scale proportionally, but also with these guardrails in place, never get uh, lower than one rem, never get bigger than 1.5. And then the result is that something like the entire interface is now scaling and going with the, the, the size of the, the viewport. 
if this idea of, of fluid typography is something that interests you, actually, to point out, like, I, I'm giving up control here. Uh, like, you might say to me, okay, well, what is the font size when the screen width is 1,024 pixels wide? And my answer would be, I don't know. I've given up control over that. I don't know what the precise number is, but I do know it's going to look fine. I do know everything will be in proportion. Um, so this idea is something that, that underlies a project called Utopia. I don't know if has anybody seen Utopia, the project? Uh, there's the URL. You can, you can grab that QR code if you want to go straight to it. And this is all about fluid type. In particular, instead of just being the font size that changes, from smaller screens to wider screens. It's about changing the, the type scale uh, as you go from smaller screens. So it might be that at a small size, you want the type scale to be something like 1.2, the ratio between those, those font sizes. And at a larger screen, you want it to be a different ratio. And Utopia will figure out everything in between. It's kind of like clamp on, on steroids. Um, but I like this because it's kind of this mixture of the designer making decisions at the extremes and then the machine figuring out all the mathematics and calculations, which is what machines should be doing, not humans, right? There's this great illustration on the Utopia website. Um, we're like, I designed this, I designed that, the extremes, and in the middle, maths designed that. That's what the computer did. Full disclosure, Utopia started life at Clear Left, the agency I work at. James Gilead and Tris Mudford, a designer and developer, put this together. Um, but it's very much in this declarative mindset Right? So I love this idea that it's this mixture of a human and a machine working together. Right? Get the human to do what humans are good at, get the machine to do what the machines are good at. You know, when Steve Jobs talked about computers as being a bicycle for the mind, this is kind of like using uh, CSS as a bicycle for design, right? an amplifier. Because CSS now can do that. CSS has a whole bunch of new functionality. And I use the word functionality intentionally. These are little functions now where you can specify these boundary conditions, where you, the designer, the human in the loop, can say, this is the minimum, that's the maximum. Figure out the precise number that actually gets calculated, right? All of these new ways of, of, of thinking about, about uh, of designing for the web. And it opens up whole new ways of designing. Um, someone who's really been at the forefront of, of thinking about these new ways of designing is Jen Simmons. She calls this intrinsic web design, right? Again, that the human and machine working together. She's got a YouTube channel called Layoutland. Well worth checking out to see what her thinking on this is. Um, another project that I think exemplifies this is uh, Every Layout. This is a book that you can buy by um, Hayden Pickering and, and Andy Bell. And it's a collection of design patterns you can use, but the important bit is that, like, it's not about specifying things precisely. It's about creating those boundary conditions and getting the computer to do the hard work. Uh, even if you don't buy the book, it's worth going to the website and reading the thinking behind it. They have axioms. And uh, one of the things they say is, instead of thinking of designing for the web as creating visual artifacts, think of it as writing programs for generating visual artifacts. I like this approach. Now, Andy Bell, as I said, is one of the people behind it. He was supposed to be here today to speak. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. Um, but when he's spoken in the past, um, he's, he's done this great talk called Be the Browser's Mentor, Not Its Micromanager. Chef's kiss. That is exactly what you get to, right? That you don't want to be um, you know, specifying very precise values to a machine. Let machines figure out the precise values. You want to be you know, declaring the work you want to get done. And he's built this website to illustrate the, this conference talk called Build Excellent Websites. And it's well worth checking out. Just give the browser some solid rules and hints, then let it make the right decision for the people that visit it based on their device, connection, quality, capabilities. So again, handing over a bit of control to the browser. Let the browser do what it's good at, the mathematics part. So there's a whole bunch of different things happening here that all feel to me like they're under the same umbrella, that the same mindset is behind these, these different projects, these, that there's something happening here, and I'm not sure what it is. Um, now, am I saying that a declarative mindset is then inherently better than an imperative mindset? Um, it depends, is the answer, which is a bullshit answer. 
Uh, and anyone time someone tells you uh, it depends as the answer to something, you should follow up with the question, it depends on what? So, is the declarative approach imp uh, inherently better than the an imperative approach? It depends on what? Well, culture, for one thing. The culture of the environment that you work in. Is it a more of an imperative style culture or is it more of a declarative style culture? Um, like let's say one aspect of culture could be management, how things are managed where you work. And I would say you could divide management into imperative uh, approaches, like you know, with the, everything's measured, you got to clock in at a certain time. It's all about your performance reviews. Maybe they install something on your computer to keep track of uh, how long you're working in specific programs. Uh, measuring outputs, basically measurements and outputs. That's the imperative approach. A more declarative approach is where. You care about the output. You care about what gets produced. You don't care how it gets produced. So if someone wants to work strange hours, let them work strange hours. If someone wants to work from home instead of in the office, let them work from home. All you care about is, the, is what comes out the other side. So maybe there's more autonomy and trust in a declarative approach to management. Which isn't always great. I will say, like some people really struggle with that. Like if you come from a place that's much more um, focused and measured, it, you can flounder if you're suddenly thrown into a declarative environment. I mean, I know where I would prefer to work, and I would say that at Clear Left, we're very much in this declarative side of things with high autonomy and trust. Um, but my point here is that culture varies. Uh, there's no one size fits all when it comes to, to companies, right? Or when there's no one size fits all way of thinking about culture. And culture is one of those things that's, that's it's usually implicit and unspoken, but it can, I believe, be made explicit through things like design systems. Now, you might think, when I say design systems, you might um, automatically think of pattern libraries and components, right? Uh, a collection of interface elements. Again, I say that's just the outputs. I don't think that's what a design system truly is. I think a design system is more a manifestation of culture. Um, one of my favorite definitions of, of design systems comes from Gina Ann, who knows a lot about design systems. She said, a design system is the way we do things around here. Like, that's what your design system is. It's, it's more about the process. And it will come as no surprise that I believe you can divide design systems into two categories, an imperative approach to design systems or a declarative approach to a design system. Now, before I dive into those two approaches to design systems, I'm going to take a step back and look at two different approaches to thinking itself. I'm going to get meta as we think about thinking. And here, I'm not talking about just thinking in terms of the web, but in terms of human beings and our overall history and how we've approached problem solving long before the web. There's two different approaches. One approach is analytical thinking, right? This is understanding how something works <coughs> by breaking it down into its component parts. And this, this is what Immanuel Kant was talking about in his critique of pure reason, right? This is what underpins the scientific method. And it serves us very well, and it works exceptionally well for things that behave exactly the same everywhere in the universe. So for physics and mathematics and chemistry, analytical thinking is excellent. I would say it's less good when it comes to messy things like human beings, but really, really good for the scientific method. The other approach to thinking is systems thinking, which is almost like the opposite, where you, you understand the parts by looking at how they all fit together in the overall system. So, to put it really crudely, analytical thinking is about zooming in, and systems thinking is about zooming out. Okay, so with those two categories in mind, now let's return our attention to design systems. And hey, the word system is right there in the name. So surely we're talking about systems thinking here, right? And yet, when I see how most people approach design systems, what I see is a lot of analytical thinking. Analytical thinking, like breaking things down into their component parts. Perhaps their atoms and their molecules. Right? You make an inv in in interface inventory break things down. It's almost the, the opposite approach to systems thinking. I'll give a, go back to our friend the button and show two different approaches to design systems when it comes to, say, uh, documenting buttons. I've got a bunch of different buttons with different colors, and you can see the border colors are different, the background colors are different on these buttons. How will I document that in my design system? Well, one way is 
I document those colors precisely. This is the imperative approach. These are the colors to use. You want to use one of those buttons? Use these colors. The declarative approach would be to take a step back, look at the system here and see what's the relationship between the colors. And then I might come to a rule, one of these boundary conditions, where I would say, you know, when it comes to, say, the top border, say the border should be 10% lighter than the background color. So I'm not going to specify the specific color. I'll leave that to the machine to figure out. But whatever it is, it should be 10% lighter than the background color. And you can pretty much translate this into CSS now as well. We've got this kind of functionality available to us. So this is the declarative approach to design systems. Am I saying that a declarative approach to design systems is inherently better than an imperative approach to design systems? The answer is, it depends. It depends, for example, on your team, on their background, on their mindset. It kind of doesn't matter whether you have a declarative mindset or an imperative mindset. What matters is what's the overall mindset of the team that you're working on. Because some people will prefer the imperative way. I just want the colors. Just give me the colors. Don't make me think. Don't make me figure out, you know, 10% light in the background color. No, no, no. I just want numbers. Where somebody else will feel much more stifled by just being presented with, these are the numbers, go use them, right? You know, when I hear um, people say things like, oh, design systems stifle creativity, what I'm hearing is a declarative designer being forced to use an imperative design system. But with someone with an imperative mindset, they would struggle with a declarative design system. Does that make sense? Like, when I was talking earlier about, you know, the approaches to musical composition, I didn't talk about, I talked about the composers, I didn't talk about their teams, I didn't talk about the people who would end up playing the music, right? So I'm comparing Mozart and Miles Davis, uh, compare their teams. Classical musicians, they have a superpower. They are trained to sight-read music. Right? Mozart can put a piece of music in front of them, they've never seen it before, and they can play it from scratch. That's absolutely amazing. Jazz musicians are trained to improvise, and that's their superpower. But, you know, if Miles Davis had brought a bunch of classical musicians in for the recording sessions of Kind of Blue and gave them, like, here's one interval, no rehearsals, go, I think the result would have been a lot different. So the team really matters. Your process matters, right? Processes from company to company. Um, Jason Grisby blogged about the, the web design process. The traditional web design process is fundamentally broken. I think we could all agree with that. Um, he shows, you know, this is kind of the, the classic diagram of how things used to be, hopefully. Uh, this very waterfall method with this handover after static mockups where we then build what's been designed. Um, he proposes something different, which is much more of a backwards and forwards in time and interplay between design and development. Definitely better. Um, still has an issue, I think, because right here in the middle, static mockups. Static mockups. Think about the, the, the tools we use. Like when we use tools, they influence how we think, they influence our behavior. They, they can't help but do that, right? We shape our tools, and our tools shape us. And if you think about the design tools we use to create those static mockups, you know, Figma, stuff like that, they're very precise, they're quite imperative, right? Pixel values, exact colors. You know, we're creating pictures of websites before we, we make the website itself. And then we go into the actual medium that we, we style things in, which is CSS. Um, I think there's a problem there, that we're going from an imperative high-fidelity mock-up to the more fluid backwards and forwards dialogue of CSS. You know, maybe the solution is we jump into CSS sooner. Are we designing in the browser? Yeah, maybe. Um, Dan Maul has this great phrase I like where he says, instead of designing in the browser, let's think about deciding in the browser. In other words, he's talking about that idea of sign-off. Instead of signing off while it's in a graphics design tool, you wait until it's actually in a browser and it's real, and then you try and get sign-off, you get the agreement. I like that idea, deciding in the browser. But CSS is kind of like, um, it's like a Rorschach test for your mindset, whether you're imperative or declarative. Because your approach to CSS I think will influence how you approach the process and tools will work. If you feel like this about CSS, CSS is broken and I want my tools to work around the way that CSS has been designed, I'd say you've probably got a more imperative mindset, you want more control, more fidelity, 
And there are tools to help you. I mean, Tailwind basically does this. CSS in JS does this. They both treat the C in CSS as a bug and work around it. So you can work in an imperative way if that's your attitude to CSS. Uh, the other attitude is to say, no, no, CSS is awesome, and I want my tools to amplify the way that CSS has been designed. And I'd say that's what a lot of those tools I was pointing to do, Utopia and uh, every layout and intrinsic web design. So it depends, is what I'm saying. I'm not saying one is better or worse than the other. It depends on your team. It depends on the culture of your company. There's one final thing that your choice depends on, and it depends on the medium you're working in. Because if you're working in a fairly tightly constrained medium, like you're doing print design, or you're doing uh, mobile apps, or you're doing any operating specific application, you actually do have a lot of control. You do know a lot about the final uh, constraints of the output. So there, an imperative approach might serve you very well, right? You could, you could take that very specific imperative approach and you, you get by. But I don't think that's going to map very well to the World Wide Web. I think on the World Wide Web, you, you want to be more like Miles. Because right, the World Wide Web is not knowable. You don't know the user's uh, browsers and connection speed, network uh, plugins, uh, their specific needs. We try to get control all the time, and this is nothing new. From the early days of the web, we've tried to do this. Now, I'm going to show my age here, but I remember when I was first making websites, and we were trying to decide how big to make the websites. And initially, it was like everybody has monitors that are 640 pixels wide. And then a few years later, it was like, no, no, everybody's monitor is 800 pixels wide. And no, 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 everyone, everybody's monitor is 1,024 pixels wide. It's trying to wa have that feeling of control when actually we never had that feeling of control, right? And of course, then mo mobile browsers came along and everybody shat the bed because, ah, oh, what size should our websites be now? It was always the illusion of control. It was this consensual hallucination we were trying to impose on something inherently fluid. To, to paraphrase the senator from Alderaan, the more you tighten your grip, the more the World Wide Web slips through your fingers. And this is not a new way of thinking about the World Wide Web. Way back in the year 2000, John Alsop wrote this article, A Dao of Web Design. 2000, that's 23 years ago. And it's all about this plea to please let the web be fluid. Take a, a, a fluid approach to the web. Reject assumptions. Reject assumptions about devices, about browsers, about networks, about people. You don't have control over how people access your website. And that's okay. And 10 years after John Alsop wrote that, Ethan Marcotte wrote an article in the same magazine called Responsive Web Design. And the first thing he does in that article is he quotes John Alsop because he's building on top of that same idea that we don't have control. And that was over 10 years ago. And now, maybe it's time for the next iteration, the next bit of evolution. Are we entering a new era of, of declarative design? Maybe. And that's up to you. I mean, CSS is an incredibly powerful tool right now. So I say let's use it, right? Let's lean into the fluid, ever-changing nature of the World Wide Web because it is such an exciting time for design on the web. And I can't wait to see what you're going to build. Thank you. Have a